the summary of the lithosphere unit. So the lithosphere is the solid outer rocky part of the Earth. Um, it's constantly being changed by tectonic activity, weather, erosion and deposition. And in this unit we look at how glacial and coastal activity affect the surface of the Earth. First, let's look at corries. Corries are where a glacier has started. At the start of your corrie answer, you would therefore be focusing on explaining what is needed for a glacier to form and how the snow turns into glacial ice. Your explanation might mention that for a glacier to start, you need cooler summers so that all the snow from the winter before isn't melted before the next winter begins and that the most likely place for the snow to survive is in the cooler, shadier, north-facing hollows. As more snow lands on top of the snow from the years before, snow in the lower layers is compressed as air is squeezed out, eventually turning into glacial ice. Once the ice begins to move downhill under gravity, it begins to enlarge the hollow into a corrie. Your explanation should focus on the processes it uses to do this. So it uses plucking, especially on the back wall, where the ice freezes onto the rock and pulls it out as it moves downhill, and this makes the back wall very steep and jagged. The rock fragments which have been taken off by plucking are then used to scrape along the bottom of the hollow, making it deeper and smoother, and this process is known as abrasion. Above the glacier, you often have freeze-thaw weathering, which makes the cliff behind the glacier very steep and jagged, and also provides more rock fragments which can fall down onto the glacier. At the front of the quarry, there's often a rock lip left, and this is because the glacier moves in a rotational way, so there's less erosion at the front of the glacier. As the glacier moves away from the back rock face, there's also a bergskund, a big crack between the rock and the ice left, and this allows rocks and meltwater to go down the back of the glacier, and it aids in abrasion. The final part of the story is that once the ice is retreated, there's often a corrie lock-in left in the bottom of the corrie, if the corrie is deep enough to reach the water table. In the exam, there's one mark available for giving a named example of a glacial or a coastal feature. So this is corrie lagging on the Isle of Skye. Two other glacial erosional features that you might be asked to explain are arets and pyramidal peaks. The good news is that if you're asked about these, you can use what you know about corries in your answer. An example of an arete is Carnmore Jerig on Ben Nevis. For an arete like this to form, you need two corries to form close to each other. For your explanation of an arete, you would focus on how plucking and abrasion make the corries bigger and wider. As the corries get wider, there's less and less land left in between them. The top of the arets gets steepened by freeze-thaw weathering, and again, you would explain how that works. Another glacial erosional feature that you may be asked to explain is a pyramidal peak, a very sharp triangular peak. This is Scurfiona on Anchelic near Dundonnell, and this is an example of a pyramidal peak. Pyramidal peaks are formed when three corries erode back into the same mountain. So here there's a corrie, there's another corrie over here, and there'll be a corrie here as well. As the corries erode deeper and deeper into the mountain using plucking and abrasion, the top of the mountain becomes steeper and sharper. Freeze-thaw weathering also works on the top of the mountain to make it even steeper and sharper. A further glacial feature that you need to be able to explain is a U-shaped valley. This is Glen Anne in the Cairngorms, a great example of a U-shaped valley with a ribbon loch and a hanging valley. To start your explanation of a U-shaped valley, you could explain how the glacier moves downhill under gravity on a layer of meltwater in between the ice and the bedrock. It tends to follow a V-shaped river valley as it's the easiest way downhill. But unlike a river, the glacier fills the whole valley. It also has a lot more erosive power than a river. And once in the valley, they enlarge the valley by plucking and abrasion, making it wider and deeper. They also tend to go straight through the bottom of interlocking spurs rather than going round them like a river does. And this means that the valley is a lot straighter. So once the ice is retreated, um, freeze-thaw weathering on the side of the valley makes the sides less steep. A feature that you often see on the side of U-shaped valleys is a hanging valley. If you're asked to explain a hanging valley, this is because the smaller tributary valleys that went into the main valley had smaller glaciers in them. Bigger, deeper glaciers have more erosive power, so the main valleys were eroded more deeply than the tributary valleys. 
After the ice has retreated, there's often a waterfall where the tributary rivers join the main valley. A good example of a hanging valley is this one in Glen Anne. Here's Corrie Raybear up here and there would have been a smaller tributary glacier coming out to join the main valley glacier in Glen Anne. The last erosional feature that you may be asked to explain is a ribbon lock. As you can see from Loch Anne here, a ribbon lock is a long narrow piece of water in the bottom of a U-shaped valley. In your explanation for ribbon lock, you would probably mention differential erosion. If there's an area of softer rock, that would be eroded quicker and easier by the glacier, resulting in a deeper area where water can accumulate. Sometimes, moraine deposited by the glacier also acts as a dam and traps water behind it. As you can tell, glaciers erode and transport a lot of material. This material is then deposited elsewhere, mostly in lowland areas, as the glacier loses power and starts to melt towards its snout. The material carried and deposited by glaciers is known as glacial till. It's an unsorted mixture of sands, gravels and rocks of varying sizes, and when wet, it's easily moulded and shaped. This leads us to an explanation of our first depositional feature, a drumlin. As drumlins are depositional features, you may want to start your answer with the glacier moving downhill under gravity, carrying lots of moraine. As drumlins are deposited directly by the glacier, they tend to be made up of unsorted material with a varying range of sizes. The material in a drumlin is also quite angular as it doesn't undergo much attrition as it's transported down by the glacier. However, as there's lots of meltwater around, the material is easily shaped and moulded by the later movements of the glacier. This results in the characteristic shape of the drumlin with a steeper stoss side and then a gentler lee side downhill of the glacier. Drumlins tend to occur in groups known as swarms. In fact, most of Glasgow is built on a drumlin field. This is the steep stoss end of a drumlin seen here in Partick. Another feature made out of glacial till is a terminal moraine seen here in Canada. This is formed out of the rocks and debris carried by the glacier which is deposited at the snout of the glacier when it melts. Like a drumlin, the terminal moraine is made up of subangular and unsorted material. Some of this material will come from freeze-thaw weathering, rocks detached from the side of the valley which then fall down onto the glacier. Some milk might come from plucking, um, rocks that have been frozen into the glacier and then again carried down. As the glacier melts, it deposits the material. If the glacier advances, um, it will push the terminal moraine in front of it. So the terminal moraine will show the furthest extent that the glacier has reached. The final glacial feature that you may be asked to explain is an esker. An esker is an example of a fluvial glacial landform. They were formed by the meltwater rivers that ran on top of, through and underneath the glacier. Just like the rivers that you will be used to seeing today, the meltwater rivers carried lots of sediment from silt and sand to large rocks and boulders. As the sediment gets carried downstream in these meltwater rivers, they hit off each other and as a result they are smoother and rounder than the glacial till found in drumlins and terminal moraine. They're also sorted in size as the river tends to deposit the bigger sediments first. Once the ice starts to melt, the material on the bottom of the rivers collapses onto the ground and forms these long ridges which follow the exact path that the river used to take through the glacier. The second part of the lithosphere unit deals with coastal features. You need to be able to explain the formation of three sets of erosional features and three depositional features. We'll start with a wave cut platform, such as this one at Southern Down in South Wales. You would start your explanation with a wave cut notch. This is quite a mature wave cut platform, but you can just see a small wave cut notch at the back here in the cliff. This happens because the processes of coastal erosion are focused on a narrow zone in between the high and the low tide marks. The processes of coastal erosion that you would be mentioning are corrasion and hydraulic action, as the wave cut notch continues to get bigger, the cliff above it becomes more and more overhanging. Eventually, it will collapse. The material from the cliff will be broken up, smaller and rounder, by attrition, and it will also be used in abrasion, both to smooth the rock platform and also to attack the cliff more. So this continues to happen, and the cliff will continue to retreat. 
um, eventually the waves will lose so much energy travelling over the wave cut platform that they won't have enough energy left to erode the cliff once they get there. Once that happens, sub-aerial processes such as freeze-thaw weathering become more important and the cliff gradually starts to become less and less steep. A further set of coastal features that you will need to explain are headland and bay. Your explanation should focus on differential erosion. Softer rock will be eroded more quickly, leading to a bay, while harder rock will stick out into the sea as a headland. Here at Swanage Bay in the south of England, the bay is made of clays and sandstone, which are softer than both the limestone in the headland to the south and the chalk in the headland to the north. However, wave refraction will concentrate the wave energy on the headlands. Waves change direction as they change speed. So as the water gets shallower around the headlands, the water bends towards it. This means that there is more erosion around the headlands leading to cliffs. In the bays, the water stays deeper for longer, meaning that there there's deposition and beaches start to form. Caves, arches and stacks are erosional features often found on headlands. Old Harry Rocks to the north of Swanage is a stunning example of such features. Your explanation for these features should start with differential erosion, with the weaker areas in a cliff eroded more quickly, mostly by hydraulic action and corrasion. Vertical lines of weakness, known as faults, are eroded into cracks and then into caves. Once the caves erode right the way through the headland, they are known as arches. They're likely to continue to get wider as the sea continues to erode the sides using corrasion and hydraulic action. The top of the arch will be attacked by sub-aerial processes such as freeze-thaw weathering and that will make it weaker. Eventually the top of the arch will collapse, leaving a stack. The material will be broken up smaller by attrition and will be used in corrasion to continue to erode the cliffs. Finally, features of coastal deposition. You need to be able to explain three landforms of coastal deposition, but they're all very similar. Your explanation for any of these features will centre around longshore drift. Longshore drift occurs when the incoming waves, known as swash, are driven up the beach at an angle by the wind. The outgoing waves, known as backwash, are dragged straight back down the beach by gravity. This means that the material is carried along the shore in a zigzag pattern. A sand spit is likely to form where the coast has a sudden change of direction, for example at the mouth of an estuary. The longshore drift will carry material out from the coastline and deposit it in a line out from the coast. There's a sheltered area behind the spit where material is deposited and there's often a salt marsh that starts to grow up here. You'll see that this spit has a bend at the end, a recurve, and this can be either due to the secondary wind direction, the longshore drift sometimes coming from that direction, or from the currents pushing a passage through. The spit will continue to grow as long as the supply of sediment deposited there is higher than the sediment that's taken away through erosion. Having a strong river means that there's more material carried away through erosion. This is sandbanks, a spit at Pool Harbour, and as you can see here, there's a strong river that comes out of Pool Harbour that stops the spit from growing any further by eroding away material from the end of the spit. If there's not a strong river, it's likely that the spit will extend all the way across the mouth of the bay, forming a bar, which is another feature of coastal deposition which you might get asked to explain. The water trapped behind the bar is known as a lagoon. Because the water is not moving, deposition is likely to take place and eventually this may turn into land. The final feature of coastal deposition that you may be asked to explain is a tombolo. A tombolo may form exactly the same way as a spit. If a spit grows out from the land and there's an island in the way, it can just attach and become a tombolo. Alternatively, it could form because the island shelters a piece of water from the prevailing wind. If the prevailing wind comes from this direction, this area of water would be sheltered and deposition would occur, forming a tombolo. So this is a lovely example of a tombolo um, from St Ninian's Isle in Shetland. And as you can see, this area is well sheltered from the prevailing wind, allowing deposition to take place. Here are some examples of questions from higher geography papers. All of them require candidates to explain the formation of glacial or coastal landscape features. You will need to give a full explanation of how they form, including all the processes we've discussed in this video. 
you should note that there's always the opportunity to use annotated diagrams in your answer and this can help you show your understanding of the processes involved.